Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. My absolute joy and delight to, to be with you this evening. And uh, I'm taking it that you can all see me and hear me, because if you couldn't, uh, Richard, I'm sure, would have given me a heads up by now. So uh, it's my absolute joy and pleasure to share with you again through Revivals Again Ministries. Uh, I'm indebted to Richard and to those who uh, serve alongside him. Uh, it's always a blessing to share with the Lord's people, and we've been somewhat limited in being able to do that. Uh, over recent times, live streaming, of course, enables us to do that to some measure. Uh, but I know that uh, Revivals Again Ministries has been a great blessing to many of you. Um, and I think one of the, the things I'm so thankful for this ministry is that not only has it been a blessing to you, uh, but I know that for many Monday evenings, you've gathered just with a focus to worship and pray. Uh, and that means that uh, this ministry, and, and for those of you who do join week by week, that uh, your heart is a blessing to God. Uh, even more than it is to others. I think I shared the last time that um, when our midweek meetings began to open up, uh, that God made it very clear that we were to do nothing but worship and pray. And we did that for, for a year. And it's only been in the last three or four weeks that we've introduced a, a Bible study, uh, study element to our midweek meetings, simply because we believe God's told us to build up the body and, and to do that with worship, the word and with prayer. And so we're thankful to God for each of you, thankful to God for Richard, thankful to God for Revive Us Again Ministries. And I was interested in hearing Richard's testimony about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how it seemed to happen after midnight. I think the last time I spoke to you back in May, uh, I shared a little bit about Cedar Court and about the times we would have there. And Kenny Gillis, who was uh, one of our main guys during these days, uh, he began to say that it seems that God only ever showed up after midnight. Um, and so looking at the clock, it's about 20 past eight. So uh, I've got the stamina, my engine, my tank is full, my engine is ready to go. So if you're okay that we keep going till after midnight, I can do that. So, <laughs> But please, please be assured, I'm only kidding you on. Uh, but let me just say on a serious point that, that you know, uh, Duncan Campbell said concerning revival. In revival, time does not exist. And that's actually what Richard and his friends experienced. That's what we experienced many times in Cedar Court. You had no thought of the, of the time uh, because your only focus was on God. And actually, when you do spend time in his presence in that kind of atmosphere, then hours feel like minutes. Uh, and I think part of the reason for that is God exists without time. He's eternal. Um, and when we enter into the fullness of his presence, then... Yeah, it's amazing just the reality of uh, encountering his glory and the change it can make for us. So I also like to thank uh, Richard for uh, paying me the greatest compliment. Uh, it's always a joy when you're asked to share with the Lord's people somewhere. Uh, but the real test for a preacher is that you get asked back. Um, and so thank you for that. I do take that as an encouragement. Uh, and I hope that what I share with you this evening um, is going to be a blessing and is going to be of encouragement to you. And when Richard uh, contacted me back earlier this year about sharing on a Monday evening, uh, he asked me to share about uh, the Holy Spirit and revival. And I began to prepare for that. And, uh, and just uh, a few days before I was going to share, God gave me a different message. And I shared on Acts 1, uh, verses 12 to 14, and prayer and revival. Because as we know, prayer precedes revival. And uh, I was genuinely looking forward this time to sharing on the Holy Spirit and revival. And again, as I was preparing, uh, God led me in a different direction. Uh, and that's why this evening we're going to think about a church in revival and uh, what a church in revival can look like. And um, just a little bit of background to lead us into this. The church where, where I came to faith, uh, the common practice was uh, that you would preach a three-point sermon, uh, which was always good. And I did that for a number of years. I, I don't tend to do that anymore unless God really leads me to. Uh, but then, of course, if you're a true Calvinist, then you grow from three points to five points and you become a five point preacher uh, because, of course, we know that there was the five points of Calvinism. So this evening, uh, if you're wondering about me being the minister of Mars Memorial and what that means, uh, then um, as people like labels, I would say that I'm a reformed charismatic Calvinist. Uh, and so taking my background, uh, then I've decided to share with you this evening a 10 point sermon. Um, and I'm not kidding, that's literally what I'm going to do. Not so much a sermon, but 10 points that highlight what it can look like to be a church in revival. 
And if you're going to be taking notes, then you better be able to write fast because I'll be speaking fast uh, and I'll cover these 10 points uh, in as uh, quick a manner as is possible. Before we actually get to, to the essence of, of what I'm going to share, um, we know that the scriptures tell us that when Jesus came to this world, he had no place to lay down his head. Uh, it's one of the remarkable things about Jesus. He had lived in the courts of heaven for the whole of eternity. And yet when he came to earth, he was a homeless refugee. Uh, that was his experience when he entered the world. And it became his experience throughout his life. Of course, he grew up in Mary and Joseph's home. But when he began his own ministry, when the Holy Spirit filled him and he began to bring the revelation of the kingdom, he literally didn't have a home. He had no house to call his own. And yet... One of the things I've discovered in the Gospel of Mark is that it is remarkable how many of the miracles of Jesus happened in the context of someone's house. And this is kind of behind what I want to share this evening, that when we read about Jesus in a house, then he was the focus. The other people who were in the house around him were giving him their undivided attention and so they were looking to him, they were focusing on him, they were in effect worshipping him. And as we'll see this evening, Jesus would teach them and he would perform miracles. And so uh, when I read about Jesus in someone's house in Mark's gospel, then for me, it's a prophetic picture of how the church can be or what Jesus wants for his church. So, so let me just uh, uh, fleece that out a little bit. So in Mark 1, uh, Jesus was in Simon Peter's house. In Mark 2, he healed the paralyzed man who was brought by the four friends. Uh, Mark 2 verse 1 actually tells us that when the people heard he had come home. Now that's significant because this home, which we reckon was Simon Peter's home, then Jesus, although it wasn't his, he wasn't just accommodated. Actually, there was space within that home given to him. So he felt home in that house. In Mark 3, uh, verse 20, Jesus entered a house and a crowd gathered around him. In Mark 5, he's in Jairus' house, uh, where he would resurrect Jairus' daughter. Uh, in Mark 7, he's in the house of the Syrophoenician woman. In Mark 9, he's in the house and the disciples are debating who's the greatest. In Mark 14, one of the most powerful accounts, Jesus is in the home of Simon the leper. And that's where Mary takes her uh, bottle of pure nard and, and pours it over Jesus. And uh, just this beautiful, extravagant act of worship. In Mark 16, we're given a little info about the two on the Emmaus road. Uh, and of course, we know that he was revealed to them when he broke bread in their house. And so as we think about revival in the church or a church in revival, then I'm going to base my thoughts on the first account we have of Jesus actually within our home and what he did in that home. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to read from Mark 1, from verse 29. Mark chapter 1, from verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went up to her, took her hand and helped her up, the fever left her and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Amen. And we know that God will bless this reading of his own holy word to us. And to his name be all the praise and all of the glory. Here we have Jesus in a house and how he, how he found himself there is of interest to us. What he did there is of interest to us. What happened as a result of being there is of interest. As a church, we all have a longing to see revival. I know that's certainly true for those of you who gather uh, regularly on a Monday evening. Uh, there might also be others here uh, from my own congregation, March Memorial, this evening. And uh, wherever you're joining us from, um, and if you have the facility to do it, say hello in the chat. Uh, not even just so much for me, but just so that Richard and others involved in Revivals Again Ministries will be encouraged to know uh, where people are joining us from for this evening. 
As we have a heart to see God move in revival, uh, we know and we have the understanding that revival is a sovereign act, that true and genuine biblical revival can only happen as a result of God himself showing up and making himself known. And whilst that's true, then every historical revival, and indeed beginning with the, the first revival of Pentecost in Acts 2, then every revival was preceded by God's people praying, by God's people hungering, by God's people petitioning heaven, by God's people asking God to come. And we have this remarkable uh, truth of the divine and the human working together. Um, and, and we just know that, that whenever God shows up, he'll come his, his way and he'll do it his way. But there are some principles, I believe, in these verses that I think we can be encouraged by, that we can learn from in order that we don't just uh, have an experience of God whereby we're encouraged by his presence in our churches, whilst that's good. But as Edwin Orr said, revival is a movement of the Holy Spirit bringing about a revival of New Testament Christianity in the Church of Christ and in its related community. And I think that we've sometimes made the mistake of experiencing something of the renewal of the Holy Spirit, where he comes and he's poured out and we experience and we're renewed in our faith and we're renewed in our relationship. And we have a fresh passion for God and we have a fresh hunger and where the gifts of the Spirit can begin to, to, free a bit more, to flow a bit more freely. And, and, and we love renewal and times of renewal. But there have been lots of times in lots of churches in Scotland where there have been these moments, these seasons of renewal. But on the whole, the associated community has largely been unaffected. When I was when I was minister in Barvis, uh, where I was before coming to Mart's Memorial, and of course the, the Hebrides revival, um, I, I got a phone call on a Tuesday afternoon, uh, and it was from a pastor from Fiji, and this pastor was uh, on government business, and he was phoning me from London, and he'd read and researched everything about the Lewis revival, and uh, he wanted to come and, and just to spend an afternoon and a few hours being around the place and asking questions and, and in prayer together. And so I said to him, by all means, if you'd like to make the journey, then, then please come. Now, in my mind, I thought, he's come from Fiji. He's in London for government business. He's going to hop on a plane from London, fly to Glasgow or Edinburgh or Inverness and fly across to Stornoway. He, he finished the conversation by saying, right, I need to go now because I've booked a hire car and I'm going to drive from London to Ullapool. Um, which would have been about probably 16 hours, there about 14 to 16 hours, get the ferry across, I'll get, be there at lunchtime, I'll have the afternoon and evening with you, I'll then get up the next morning, get the ferry and drive back to London. But when he said that, I came off the phone and I thought, this man is mad. I mean, I, I, you know, I've dr driven and I've been on that ferry sometimes and it can be so tiring. And so I think my flesh affected me. So, so I actually phoned him on the number that he had given me. And, um, and it transpired that because I phoned to say, listen, I think you're a bit mad. You know, let's, let's work out another way that we can have a chat and I can pray. And, and, uh, but he never got the message. And, and so the next day he turns up and he tells me that uh, in his church, that in the previous five years, they'd grown from 500 people to 6,000 people. And they knew a movement of the Holy Spirit. But the reason why he had come to Lewis and the reason why he was so taken by the Lewis revival was he said, it pains me to tell you that all that we are seeing of God, whilst it is wonderful, people are having to come to the church to experience him. That our community outside of the church is largely unaffected. And he said, the one thing that I've learned about the Lewis revival is as in the words of Duncan Campbell, God came down and it was a community saturated by the presence of God. And as we come to think about these verses in Mark 1, this is what I want to see. Jesus originally coming and being found in a house. But because he is in a house, then what he does and use of what he does and the power of what he does cannot be limited and contained. So it spills out into the community. And so a community is transformed. 
as a result. And I want to encourage you with whatever vision you have of revival. If your vision of revival does not include your community being totally transformed by the gospel and by the kingdom of God coming, then your vision of revival is too small. So, 10 marks of a revived church. Are we ready to go? Excellent. Mark 1. A sign of revival is when God's people have a fresh love for the church. I've mentioned, I think, the last time that uh, I, I wrote a book during lockdown. And by God's grace, I've been signed by a publisher. And uh, the book is called Sleeping Giant, a call to the church to awake and arise. And uh, God willing, it's in the final editing process. It will be released either in December or January. Uh, and um, I'm excited about the prospect because it's just my heart looking to communicate God's heart. And one of the titles in the book is Every bride is beautiful. And my theology of the local church has been influenced and shaped by the teaching of John Wimber. I think one of the greatest gifts that John Wimber gave to the church, one of the greatest legacies, is his profound love, not just for his church, and not even just for the vineyard church, but for the whole church, for the whole body of Christ. If you gather with us any Wednesday or Sunday here in Mars Memorial, most Sundays, if we feel led by God to pray for the church, we will pray as much for the other churches in our community. And we even pray, and God, if it means that you show up in revival in the free church along the road on Kenna Street, God, we will rejoice and give you praise every bit as much as if you were to do it and show it up here. You see, we read at the start of... Uh, Verse 29, as soon as they left the synagogue. We, we know that the Bible tells us, Luke 4, verse 16. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Jesus was in the habit of going to church every Sunday. It's not just a good idea, it's a God idea. And you know something that blows my mind about Jesus going to church? Um, let's be honest. Uh, have you ever been to church and come away after a Sunday morning, a Sunday evening, and, and felt a little bit dissatisfied and felt, hmm, wasn't sure about that today. It didn't quite tick the boxes. Um, you know, it didn't quite do it for me today. Well, Jesus, for the whole of eternity, had enjoyed the perfected praise of angels. He had the perfect communion of Father and Holy Spirit. I can't imagine having had that experience of glory, the, the, the angels singing his praises, giving him worship, and him leaving that to come to this earth and then going to church on Sunday. I mean, two totally different worlds. And yet, two similar worlds. Because it was his father's house. And his father was being worshipped. And Jesus loved the father. And he loves uh, when people gather to worship the father. And I just think it's powerful that part of the testimony of Jesus was. And he could have, I'm sure. And sometimes he did pinpoint some of the issues and some of the failures of the local church, the local synagogue. We know that he upturned the tables. And so there was times that he had to actually do something rather significant to get the focus back on the worship of his father. And yet because of the love he had for his father, then he made it a practice in his life to, to love the local church, to bless the local church, to be a part of the local church. I, I think one of the reasons why this is such a, a critical issue right now is, I think one of the, and I only see this in part, but in, in the challenge of the last 18 months, I think the enemy has been having an absolute field day with trying to discourage and even disconnect people from their local churches. So people who before the pandemic were very committed to their local church and felt very much part of it. And then maybe because there was limited online resource or, or there was a period where, where there was not, no real connection. 
Uh, and I think to a degree that, that for some of God's people that we may be, and they may be relied on, on church on a Sunday for their spirituality and, and for their connection with God and, and they would get filled up again and that would get them going and keep them going till the next Sunday. And that was taken away. And so uh, we know Peter Linus of um, Evangelical Alliance, he, he re released an article over the course of the weekend, uh, some of the, the various things that he's seen in the post-COVID church. But one of them is that most churches are seeing about 50 to 60 percent uh, of those who would have gathered before COVID have returned. Only 50 to 60. That means there's a 40 to 50 percent who haven't re-engaged. Now it may be that for some in our community it's it's there's still anxiety around COVID. It may be that we still have to wear masks and it won't come until then. But I think behind all of that, and, and, and I want to invite you to pray into this, I do think that the enemy is seeking to, to disconnect people from local church because he knows how key local church is in terms of the kingdom purposes of God. And, and so whenever I have a sense of, of the enemy and his activity, then I, I don't just uh, look to pray in response to that. I always think, how can we move in the opposite spirit? And, and so when we opened as a church, and, and obviously we've been open for a few months now, but when uh, our Sundays began to pick up again, then uh, I wanted to resource our congregation to encourage, because I know they love God and I know they love the church and I wanted to help re-engage their hearts with that. And so I found this book that had been written during the pandemic. Uh, the book is called Love Your Church, Eight Great Things About Being a Church Member. It's by Tony uh, Merida. It's, uh, written, it's published by the Good Book Company. And uh, Alistair Begg is, is one of the folk who endorsed it. This book has reminded me why it's a thrill to be part of the local church. David Platt, a great uh, teacher and missionary. I love the church more after reading this, and I'm confident you will too. And so I want to encourage you that um, if you're struggling with a love for the church, uh, your own church or the church in general, then I think this could be a helpful resource for you. And if you're a pastor, so, so we, we purchased over a hundred of these books and we gave them away free. Um, and, and our folk have taken them and I know it's been a blessing to them. So I better move on. Mark 1, the sign of a church and revival, the sign of a, of a revived church is that people have a fresh love for, the, for their church and for the church. So we have a love for our own local community, but we also have a love for the church of Christ. And we pray blessing and we just ask God to do greater things there. Mark 2 of a church and revival. And this is a paradox. Because <laughs> having just encouraged you to love the church and for me to love the church, our love for the church should be there. But we should never be satisfied by what the church offers us. And so Mark 2 of a church and revival is when people are no longer satisfied with church. Because as Richard so helpfully spoke about and prayed in, in our opening time of worship, that actually we have a growing hunger for Jesus, a deeper longing for Jesus. But we read in verse 29, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. And so Jesus has been in the synagogue. He's been to church for worship with some of his friends, some of the disciples. And as they're leaving the synagogue, then Simon and Andrew, Simon Peter actually was the main person, then he says to Jesus, and he says to James and John, hey, come on over for some lunch. Why don't you come over to the house? And, and I want to reveal to you in a moment, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, but Simon Peter actually had, he had an angle in making such a request, but, but that didn't seem to bother Jesus. But, but the bottom line is, is that when you gather in church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, you know, we are so thankful for the worship of God's people. We are so thankful for the reading and the preaching of God's word. We're so thankful sometimes for prayer ministry and our encountering God. But please don't allow church to satisfy you. Church should be the starter. That, that just awakens the appetite, but we know, oh, there's more, and there's something to come. There's something greater to come. 
And I think that, you know, although I've said about how the enemy is, I think, working in, in, in the void of, of church, I think God is looking to do the opposite in that he's actually stirring a fresh hunger within the heart of God's people who are reconnecting and who are re-engaging. And I have to say that we've seen that in our own church prayer meetings. I mean, they have, they have just been remarkable. Kenny and, and more so Brian and I, when we would lead our midweek meetings, we'd come with a structure and we would usually start praying about uh, maybe about five to eight. And we'd plan to have a, not a break, but we'd have a worship song maybe about half past eight and then have some more prayer till after nine. And almost every Wednesday, when we would start prayer about five to eight, we, we had no opportunity to have another worship song, to have another reading of scripture, because we couldn't stop people praying. And actually, you know, oftentimes at about quarter past nine, we would have to say, listen, folks, we have some youth here. You know, some of you are working tomorrow. Uh, why don't we just leave it there? And every week the same thing would happen. Uh, and I pray that's happening where you are. That, that, and, and I think a midweek prayer meeting gives us the opportunity for that kind of expression of hunger. Where it's just like, yeah, we're only here for you. And where we put words to that hunger. And, and so as James and John and Simon and Andrew, as they leave the synagogue, they're so thankful for the time they've just had. But they say to Jesus, we're not leaving you behind. We want to take you with, with us to our own home. And, and here's uh, one of the reasons why I believe they did that. When they were in the synagogue on this particular Sunday, a man turned up with an evil spirit. And you can read about it in, in verses 21 to verses 28. And Jesus miraculously delivered this man. He told the demons to be quiet. Uh, he told him to come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him. And the fruit of that, verse 27, the people were all so amazed that they began to ask each other. And they spoke about Jesus' teaching and his authority and his power. So, so I want you to get this. Simon, Peter and Andrew, they left for church that morning. And as they make their way, they leave his, Simon Peter leaves his mother-in-law in bed. She's sick. Normally, she would have gone with them to the synagogue, but, but she couldn't. She was unwell. They're in church for a Sunday morning service. Not only is Jesus present, but he's, he brings his kingdom and, and deliverance happens. And a testimony of Christ as Lord and God and healer and deliverer is brought forth. And I think that Simon, having witnessed that, he's then thinking about his mother-in-law back home. And so he had a vested interest in saying to Jesus, come back to the house for some lunch. And I think we have evidence of that. And here's where I want to encourage you. We want to encounter the reality of the presence of Jesus when we gather for worship. So the difficulties and the struggles that we've left home or we've left in our workplace or we've left in our school or we've left in our college, that what we've encountered of Christ on a Sunday gives us faith to know I'm taking him with me there and I know that his kingdom will make a difference. I know that his kingdom can break in into the challenging situation that I'm facing. And so a church in revival will find a people who whilst they're thankful for the presence of Jesus, they will no longer be satisfied by knowing his presence in church. They will take him home with them and they will have faith for what he's able to do in their own homes and in their own families. Mark 3, the third mark of a church in revival. And it's kind of tied into what I've just said, but, but let me just read verse 30. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. A sure sign of a church in revival is when the people who are part of that church live with such a kingdom awareness and such a kingdom expectancy that the issues and problems that they have no answer to, that because they've been transformed by the renewing of their mind, that they no longer look at the issues and the problems through reason and logic, but they look at these issues and problems through who our king is and what his kingdom looks like when he comes. A revived church 
we'll see a believing people who have increased faith for miracles, signs, and wonders. That we are unapologetic about who our king is and what his kingdom looks like. I think we've got real evidence of this uh, later on in, in the book of Acts. And um, when, when Peter and John had been arrested for healing the crippled beggar and warned not to preach the gospel anymore. And I know these verses would be very familiar to you. And, and, and they gather for this prayer meeting. The first thing they do in, in light of opposition is pray. And, and, and the first thing they do in prayer is sovereign God. Uh, you allowed this to happen. Uh, you, you and, and they speak about how what happened to Jesus, that it had all been part of God's sovereign plan. And so they're saying, we don't want this persecution. We don't appreciate it other than the fact we know that it's driving us to our knees and making us rely on you. We can't do anything without relying on you. And in the context of that prayer, they pray this verse uh, 29 and 30. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your servant, Jesus. Unashamedly praying for miracles. Unashamedly praying for signs and wonders. And I'll tell you how subtle the enemy is. Uh, there's, there's a danger that because we want to appear so enlightened and so good with our faith, that, oh, I don't want, you know, people could misunderstand us praying for that, that we somehow need God to prove himself. I've got to be honest, we've been praying these kind of prayers in our midweek meeting, not because our faith is low and we need God to show up, quite the opposite. It's because our faith is high and we believe who he is and that he still is where he always was and he still does what he always did. And so can you imagine how different your life and mine would be if day to day we lived with this kingdom mindset that when we encounter either difficulties or struggles ourselves or in the lives of our loved ones, that we immediately remember who our king is and what his kingdom looks like when it comes. That miracle signs and wonders should be part of who uh, our story and our life and our experience of living with God and living for God. Mark 4, the fourth mark of a church in revival. Prayer becomes more of a priority in the life of the church, in the life of individual believers, and in the homes and families where they are. Verse 30 went on to tell us, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. What do we do when we pray? Especially when it's intercessory prayer. We're telling Jesus about the situations, the circumstances, about the people that we're concerned about. That we long for his presence to show up in their lives for his kingdom to come. By telling Jesus about his mother-in-law, Simon is evoking. He's saying to Jesus, I'm telling you this because I'm asking you to get involved. I'm asking you, in effect, to bring healing to my mother-in-law. And, and here's a bit tongue-in-cheek. I mean, that, that is revival. When you want your mother-in-law healed, I mean, that's only God. <laughs> I'm only kidding. My mother-in-law's in glory, and she was a wonderful mother-in-law, and I'm sure yours is too. But, but you get the point. This kingdom mindset has so influenced them. That, that they know that where they are limited and what they're able to do for Simon for his mother-in-law, that if I just tell Jesus about her, then he can do what I can't. He can do the impossible. I wonder this evening, who do you need to speak to Jesus about? Because I'll tell you one of the mistakes we're in danger of making. We either encounter such difficulties and struggles ourselves or we encounter it within the context of our home and family and we get caught up in the situation so like Peter walking on the water all of a sudden we begin to flap and we see the wind and the waves and we begin to sink and, and if that happens then then our focus isn't where it should be and we need to get our eyes back on to Jesus just like Simon Peter here and we need to acknowledge our own limitations and what we cannot do but we pray to him for whom there is nothing that is impossible when i was minister in, in barbas um there was 
you know, lots of uh, young people in the community, and there was very few when I first went to who would ever come to church. Uh, and I remember um, a number of times parents, sometimes grandparents, coming to me and apologizing and saying, you know, we're trying to encourage them to come, and, and they just won't come. And I gave the same piece of advice to every one of these parents and grandparents, and I've done it for some here in Martins. I've said to them, listen, you need to be very, very careful. You need to honor your young person. You need to honor where they're at. I understand your heart for them. I understand your love for them. But you do need to be careful because especially in a religious culture like ours, then, then the, the bottom line is that some people are just far too heavy handed with their children and young people. And instead of drawing them to the church, they draw them away from the church. But then I would give them this piece of advice. It might not always be at the right time or even appropriate for you to speak to your young person about Jesus. But let me assure you, it is always the right time. And it is always appropriate for you to speak to Jesus about them. And I'm telling you, that lifted a burden off so many of them. It freed them up. And, and so they began to not think about trying to get the gospel in or an invitation to church, but they began to speak to Jesus about their children and young people. They did what Simon Peter did. And maybe, you know, there is someone you're burdened for. If it's not yourself, a family member, a child, a grandchild, and you're, you're, you're pulling your hair out thinking, what can I do? Well, maybe you need to put your hair back in, get your eye back on Jesus and just speak to him. Just tell him the issues, tell him what's going on and tell him what you think. Uh, what you long for his kingdom to do uh, for that loved one. Number five, are we all doing okay? Good, good, good. Uh, I want to encourage you that the first four points are the longest, so the next five or six are going to be shorter, so, so be encouraged with that. Number five, another sure sign of a church in revival is when there are real and current testimonies of Jesus' power to save and power to heal. In response to Simon Peter talking to Jesus about his mother-in-law, verse 31 tells us, so he went to her, took her hand, and held her up. The fever left her. And so they had seen deliverance happen in the context of the synagogue worship that morning. Jesus' authority revealed as his kingdom came and delivered this man who had been demon-possessed. And no sooner had that happened than here they are now in, in this house, in this church. And having spoken to Jesus, then his mother-in-law is immediately and miraculously healed. And I, I can't speak about your church and my church, but I, I can't speak about my own. There are so many things right now that in spite of all we've been through, that we are actually very encouraged about in terms of what God is doing. And we have so much to be thankful for. And God knows that we're genuinely thankful. But he also knows that in my heart and here on a Wednesday night, we are crying out, God, you need to bring salvation. You need to save the lost. God, you need to heal people. We have people in our church family who have long-term health issues. And by God's grace, we've taught them that God is good. And we don't understand there's a mystery at times of why we don't see it. But all we know is, is that if they're not healed, then we keep praying and we keep praying and we keep praying. But when genuine revival comes, that then salvation and healing actually becomes something that becomes much more regular, much more the norm. And I know actually that for many of you, that, that this is uh, the reason why you have such a heart for revival. That, that you know and you love to see the lost saved and you love to see the, the sick healed and you love to see those who are in bondage delivered. And, and that's what it can look like in the life of the church. And that's why we continue to pray for revival. A church in revival, the supernatural does become natural. Because the kingdom of God is so near. And this is what I want to highlight from this. The reason why we read that Jesus went to her, took her by the hand and helped her up, the fever left her. It wasn't because of who else was in the house. It wasn't even because of the prayer that Simon Peter made. It was because of Jesus himself showing up 
and working and bringing his kingdom to bear in that situation. That then so however encouraging our churches might get and however good our worship might be and however the biblical teaching can be, we are thankful for all of that. But we need Jesus himself to show up and bring his kingdom with him so that we begin to see signs that only he can do salvation and healing and deliverance. Uh, and I am sharing only with you 10 marks of a revived church. And I've just shared with you Mark 5. But I'm going to be a bit fly. Because here's 5A. <laughs> because I didn't want to go to 11. So here's 5A. For your great encouragement. You know that when God begins to move in revival, more often than not, the first fruit of revival is often seen in the families and in the homes of those who have prayed for it to come. Everyone else who had been to the synagogue that day went away with an amazing testimony of who Jesus was and what he was able to do. But he didn't go to their houses because they didn't invite him. But because Simon Peter asked him to come, then his mother-in-law is healed. And having spent a lot of time with those who were saved in revival, and I know that when Richard had Agnes share her testimony, what was her testimony? Her mother and father were spiritual parents of that revival. They experienced household salvation. And I'm telling you, that by far the majority of those who were saved in the Lewis revival, they were the children of those who were part of the church and who had been praying for the revival. And I know that prophetically that God wants to take this testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, and he wants to call forth faith for you who has been a faithful follower, a faithful person of prayer. And sometimes I think we, we make the mistake that when we think about praying for revival, we look at the big picture and we look at the nation and we look at a city and we look at our community. And believe me, as we're going to see, that's all part, part of revival. But revival can be at its most powerful and precious when the king shows up in your own house and when he begins to show up in your own family. And that can be part of the first fruits of revival, which is why I want to encourage you. Keep praying and keep believing. Mark number six of a church in revival. We we'll recognize a church is in revival when people don't only have a fresh love for the church, but where they have a fresh passion to serve in the church. Verse 31 again. So Jesus went to her, took her by the hand and helped her up. The fever left her. And she began to wait on them. Isn't it true that when you and I first came to faith, that, you know, first of all, we expected the whole world to be saved there and then. <laughs> there was a, a naivety, but yet a beauty about that. But isn't it true that part of our love and our adoration for Jesus was, uh, I, have, I, I want to do something. And it wasn't just about a zeal to share our faith. It was, how can I help? How can I serve? And I think one of the tragedies of modern church life is that there's almost this danger that the longer someone is a believer, the more disconnected they become with those who are unbelievers, but also the, the, the less that they seem to be actively involved in the life of their congregation. Now, now I've got to say, for us again here locally, that's not our story. We are very, very fortunate and, and we've worked at, you know, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He loves the generations and all generations need to be working together. And, and, I, and I just think that when we're going to see God move, then for people in your church and mine, and this has happened to me two or three times in my, in, in my years here in Martins, where, where I've had not one, but maybe eight or ten people come up to me, oh, uh, I have encountered God afresh. Tell me, is there something I can do? I'm willing to do anything. And I promise you, sometimes that is, even if it's cleaning the toilets, they just feel, I want to do something. And Simon Peter's mother-in-law, she's just been healed. Now, remember, this, this is a picture of the church. They're having this wonderful fellowship. 
she would have been more than entitled to sit down there and just share testimony of her being healed by Jesus. And she would have uh, uh, very likely done that and, and sharing a brief testimony. But yet as she does that, she begins to say, right, how can I help? And she begins to serve Jesus and the others that are in the house. Simon Peter's mother-in-law knew that she was saved and she was healed and she had been saved to serve. And I think that's going to be one of the hallmarks that we're going to see um, in when a church is in revival. I, I was listening to uh, a pastor recently, pardon me, who um, had someone come up to him. They're in a city context and, and one of their members came up to him at the end of the service and, and said to him with real energy and enthusiasm, uh, do, do we have a ministry to the Chi Chinese community? Because in this city, there's a very strong Chinese community. And, and the, the pastor could see the enthusiasm. And uh, so he said to this individual, uh, I don't know, do we? And, and the person said, no, no, you don't understand me. I said, does our church have a ministry to the Chinese community? And the pastor said, no, you don't understand me. I'm asking you, do we? Because... You're part of the body. You are the church. So let me ask you, are you reaching the Chinese community? <laughs> now, uh, it was a little bit tense, but actually the fruit of it was that this man during that service had been given a burden for the Chinese community. He, he shares it with his pastor, but who then realizes and has the wisdom and the grace to help coax this, coax this man along so that he knows God is calling me to do this. And up until that day, they hadn't had an overt ministry. They did various things to help them, but they didn't have an overt ministry. But they soon did, and that man headed up that team. So when we're thinking about what the church could be doing, or what the church should be doing, and I think we're going to have amazing opportunities come out of, out of COVID, then have your coulds and have your shoulds. But please consider the question, what are you doing? What am I doing? We've been saved to serve. And, and Simon Peter's mother-in-law, her service, yes, she begins to wait on them. This was just part of her worship, her love and her adoration for what she'd encountered in meeting with Jesus. Let's move on to Mark 7. Mark 7, uh, seventh Mark, sorry, of a church in revival. Verse 32, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. Here we now see the difference between renewal and revival. They could have sat in that house, enjoyed a good testimony meeting, enjoyed the fellowship. But what God did in Jesus being manifestly present, in his kingdom coming and being explored, then God makes sure that this community comes alive to the fact that Jesus is in this house and that he is performing miracles, signs, and wonders. Duncan Campbell put it like this, that the Holy Spirit is the greatest evangelist the church has. And what the Holy Spirit does, and he did this in Lewis Revival, that's why we have the testimonies of the hundreds of people gathering outside the church. It's why we have the testimony of the hundreds of people gathering outside the police station. It's why we have the testimony in Arnold, of revival breaking out and people coming out of their homes carrying chairs, making their way to the meeting house. That when Jesus comes and his kingdom comes, then God has created humanity with eternity in their hearts. And in a divine, supernatural way, I mean, I think this could have been at least partly through human means. Uh, and let's think about that, that Jesus shows up in a house to such a degree that those who are there and who encounter him uh, can't deny that. And it becomes the most natural thing in the world to gossip the gospel. So you go far and wide and all of a sudden the community know, oh, he's here. He's in our church and he's performing miracles. Then I'm telling you, people will come. So there can be a human element to it. But the Lewis revival bears testimony to the fact that sometimes it's just sovereign. A sovereign God working in a sovereign way by the power of the Holy Spirit, awakening the eternity that is in people's hearts and drawing them to his house where they can encounter him. And of course, in this house, the people that come are the sick and demon-possessed. 
because the testimony has come from Jesus. Isn't that amazing? What did he do in the synagogue that morning? He delivered a man demon-possessed. What did he do in Simon Peter's house? He healed his mother-in-law. Who are the people, the two main, what's the main constituency of the people who come? The sick and the demon-possessed. Because they know that the king has come and that he's brought his kingdom with him. And I'll tell you what I find so powerful about that is that it's the first few words that evening after sunset. Let me tell you why that's so significant. Jewish culture was that on the Sabbath, you went to the synagogue, you went home and you spent the rest of the day with the family. And there would be usually no reason why you would leave the house and leave your family again until the next day. And here's what is so wonderful about the gospel. People in, uh, near Simon Peter's house in the vicinity, in the community around him, which is in Capernaum, they, they hear about Jesus and they, they normally settle down for the evening. And so much so that even after sunset, they wouldn't go out after sunset. They didn't have streetlights. There was a fear for safety. And so what we have is the, prophet, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And the people are willing to come out of their homes where they normally wouldn't. At a time when they normally wouldn't. And they make their way to this house symbolizing for us the church. Because they know that Jesus is present. And that they have the opportunity of meeting with him. We long for the day in your church and mine. When we don't just have good and encouraging church services. But Jesus is so manifest. And the power of his kingdom has come to such a measure. That either through human agency and people saying, Jesus has come, you need to come to meet with him. Or through the Holy Spirit awakening people's hearts. That people out there in darkness just begin to come and make their way so that they might encounter Christ. The mark number eight of a church in revival. I mean, let's be honest. To get some of these marks would be amazing. I mean, to see this lived out is just astounding. But, but, but Mark 8 blows my mind. I mean, it just does. Verse 33. The whole town gathered at the door. Now, <laughs> what did that look like? A whole town. Well, where do you live? But what's the population of your town? I find myself this evening in beautiful Stornoway. Population of Stornoway is between seven and 8,000 people. That's very small compared to most of you. Can you imagine? You go to church on Sunday. And you go at your usual time, rushing in five minutes before the service starts. And, and, and you, you're hoping that no one had better take in your seat. Because you're at your usual time, but you want to sit in your usual place. But when you come, the closer you get to your church, there's a queue of people waiting to get in. Now, I know that sounds almost ridiculous. I mean, maybe at best improbable, maybe, you know, maybe even impossible. But please remember who our king is. And please remember that actually lost people are desperate. They are really desperate. And when they come alive to that. See, the sick and the, the demon possessed were the first ones who came. But it wasn't limited to that. And one of the things I can't wait to see, please God in revival, is seeing the lost saved, the sick healed, the, 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 those in bondage delivered. But, but I long to see those who have need of nothing. They've got the two, the two cars outside the house and everything is rosy in the garden. But they come awakened to the fact that they are sinners without a savior. And they come because they know that Jesus is in the house. The whole town gathered at the door. Now, it may be that this was a figure of speech and that Mark had carried away, carried away just hyperbole. Did the whole town really gather? We can't say for sure, but certainly a significant number came. And so let me remind you again about your town, about your city. If you don't have faith for the whole of your town to gather, what about 50%? 50% of 
That would mean for us here, that would be three and a half thousand. Now, I think three and a half thousand with all the churches in Stornoway, all the churches in Stornoway could probably just about cope with three and a half thousand. But actually, if we're going to be true to the passage, this was one house they came to. I mean, just imagine that. And if you don't have faith for 50% of your town or city turning up, well, well go to 25%. If that's too much to be 25%. If you live in Aberdeen, if you live in Glasgow, if you live in Edinburgh, imagine 5%. Hundreds, thousands of people coming. And the key is, is that the king has come. What a God we serve. Just remember that it was, it was Duncan Campbell who said, God came down and he described revival as a community saturated by the presence of God. That's what we have here in Mark 1. Oh my. Number nine. We're almost there. You've done very well. And this kind of gets back to a point that, that I made earlier. But as you know, as a minister, you have to repeat at least one point. So, so give me the grace for that. The whole town gathered at the door, verse 34. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. When a church is in revival, the power of Jesus is present to heal through miracle signs and wonders. And, and what we're seeing here in, in Mark is that these things don't just happen as a one-off. But there's a regularity. And, and listen, I'm like you. We rejoice with the whole of heaven over one sinner who repents. We rejoice when we see the smallest answer to prayer and someone being healed. We don't take any of it for granted. But, but God knows and I believe he's birthed this. There's a dissatisfaction in my heart and my soul that, that, that we might have testimonies like that once every month, once every two months. And I want to get to a place where they were in Mark where actually salvation and healing is something that is happening all of the time. That there's a regularity to what it is that he's doing. That's what's presented for us here. And, and you know what is so powerful about this is that, and this will lead us into the final lesson, lesson 10, is that Simon Peter invited Jesus to his house. And if you and I are serious about being a church in revival, then we need to be prepared for something. Jesus had been invited as a guest, but because his kingdom came and was made manifest, Simon Peter has no choice. He gives his whole house over to Jesus and to the ministry of Jesus. He, he's, he's not limiting those who can come in. He's not saying, oh, but what about, I mean, <laughs> in Mark 2, the roof would be taken off his house. I mean, that, that's what it would mean for him. That's the implication of having Jesus showing up. And if you're a pastor or a leader, then like me, you live and you long and you burn for Jesus and his kingdom showing up and miracle signs and wonders beginning to happen. But I've got to tell you, when that comes, be prepared for disruption. Be prepared for things that you hadn't planned. What we really have to do is, Jesus, it's your church anyway. I give over my whole church. I give over all that we are and all that we have to you so that your kingdom can come still more. In one of the chapters in my book, when I speak about actually Mark 2 and, and the, the disciples ripping the roof off, and one of the points that I make in that, the, the chapter's entitled, uh, Making Jesus Feel at Home, uh, which sounds lovely and homely, but... Uh, I make the point that historically, revival causes as many problems as it solves. And we need to be real about that. I think it would have been somewhat challenging for Simon Peter to have his house overrun, even more so to have the roof taken off. But you get to a stage where your love for Jesus and what he's doing comes first and everything else will take care of itself. That's what we're longing for. That's what we're living for. I know how precious our churches can be to us. But 
in revival, we will live with a constant awareness that it's not our church, it's his church. And when we invite him to come, we will allow him to do whatever he pleases. Leonard Ravenhill said this, you cannot pray to a sovereign God to come in power and then tell him what he can or cannot do. The second part of the prayer cancels the first. Let's continue to pray to our sovereign God and let's say, and whatever it takes and whatever it looks like and whatever it costs, just come. You've done amazing. If you're still online and you're still part of this Zoom, uh, then we've reached, uh, Mar we've reached number 10 uh, of our 10 marks of a church and revival. And uh, we're told in the rest of verse 34, Jesus also drew about many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Let me tell you, whenever Jesus and his kingdom shows up, the devil will show up. But what I love in these verses, and I think this is a lesson that, that God reminded me of this week in preparing for this. We, we know that in this instance and in some of the other miracles of Jesus, you know, there was the boy who, who was having fits and, and, and you know, the, the, the disciples couldn't do it and Jesus would heal him. And, and just when the crowds were starting to come, the boy has another convulsion and Jesus immediately heals him. And he does that mainly because of compassion, but also because Jesus knew the enemy's tactics. That when Jesus and his kingdom came, the enemy would kick up some dust and cause some kind of furore, looking to bring a distraction so that the very kingdom things that Jesus was doing would somehow be lost. And because all of a sudden our, our gaze is taken to, the, to our real enemy and to distraction that he's looking to bring. And, and this is a lesson that I continually have to learn because here's what I believe this verse tells us. That when the enemy kicks up a stink because, or, or when he's beginning to, to cause upset in the church because of what Jesus is doing. Unless Jesus tells you and tells me specifically to deal with that, we leave it with him. We leave it with Jesus. We pray about it and we say, Jesus, you take authority. You deal with this situation because Jesus himself drives out the demons and he takes authority. He doesn't let the demons speak because they know who he was. And so his power and authority was seen in the healing, in the deliverance, and even in the fact that he was able to silence and deal with these demons. Because of the power and authority he had. Now, now, this is something that, as I say, God kind of caught my heart with. There will be instances where the enemy, because of what Christ is doing or looking to do, where the enemy will look to kick up a fuss. And all I want to suggest to you, because this is going to be my practice, and it has been my practice, I've got to be honest, over recent years, is I take that to Jesus and I ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? And increasingly, I have to say, and I'm in one of these seasons right now where he's telling me, you just keep your focus and attention on me and the greater extension of my kingdom and leave that to me. And that I trust him with some of the mess, with some of the, the, the stuff that's kicking off. And, and that but my heart is always open if I need to engage or if I need to you know, take action as a pastor and a leader. I am not in any way fearful of doing that, but I do think that part of the model here is, and let me tell you why I think I'm making this point, is because I do think sometimes we're on the verge of something really significant in terms of Jesus and his kingdom. But because the enemy keeps up a fuss, we consume ourselves with that and the individuals who are causing it. And it saps our spiritual energy and we end up sometimes beaten up battered and bruised and it takes us a while to get back to the place where we were with our focus on Jesus and his kingdom and it seems like almost like we've got to start all over again that won't always be the case and I'm speaking mainly to leaders but I'm telling you that for me in the season I'm in unless Jesus is directly telling me then I give the situation to him and ask him as Lord King of Kings to deal with it you know this is so real and I'll finish with this in terms of 10 marks of a church and revival. Duncan Campbell said that whenever he heard of a church and revival, one of the first questions he would ask is, is there any opposition to it? And if he was told, no, there doesn't appear to be any, 
then he would doubt its authenticity as a genuine revival. Because he knew it went with the territory. And that's exactly what Mark 1, 29 to 34 brings alive for us. And, and in some ways, to be a church in revival should come with a public health warning. But I'll tell you the choice I've made. I would much rather face the challenges and the struggles because of life breaking all over the place than death. Give us life all day long. Give us what happened in Simon Peter's house all day long. And give us that, Lord, so that our churches and our communities and our nation are in revival. And all for the glory of Jesus. Amen.